All right, everyone, we're going to go ahead and get things started. Um, if you have not yet done so, please introduce yourself in the chat. Let us know your name, where you're calling in from, and one thing that you would like to learn from tonight's panel event series. My name is Aitan Salahi. I'm founder and executive director of the Planetary Health Collective. We have been hosting these panel series on a monthly basis, basis for a little over a year now, and it's just been a really awesome opportunity for members of our community to connect with leaders in sustainability and nutrition like the ones you're going to be meeting tonight and get an idea of how you can integrate sustainability into your career. So um, we're going to chat a little bit tonight about um, some norms and etiquette on the call. Then I'll share a little bit about the Planetary Health Collective, just in case you are new to us, even though I do see a couple of familiar names in the participant list today. Um, and we're also going to then transition over to Breta, who is going to be moderating our event tonight. So she has prepared a handful of questions that we are going to discuss with our panelists. And then throughout the entirety of the event, you'll all have an opportunity to send your questions directly into the chat. So we highly encourage that. We'd like to keep this as casual and comfortable as as possible um, while still respecting each other's time and um, using the chat feature to collect questions. So as you have like moments of inspiration, if somebody says something that's really inspiring to you, feel free to pop it into the chat and let us know. Um, and as questions come up, send them in so that we can um, get you connected with our panelists and get some wisdom spread. Um, and lastly, we'll close out with some opportunities to get involved with the Planetary Health Collective. So, Let's jump right into our norms and etiquette. So first, if you have not yet done so, please go ahead and mute your line. Um, this is just to help us make sure that we keep to schedule, respect your time, respect our panelists' time. And if you do have anything uh, that you do want to share, again, those reflections and questions, you can direct those straight into the chat. Um, and then again, introduce yourself there. Let us know your name, where you're calling in from, and something that you are excited to learn about during tonight's, tonight's chat. As always, this is a safe, diverse, and identity-affirming space, and we practice respect here. So any form of hate speech will result in removal from the call, and I know that will not be a problem for anybody in this community. Um, and again, just go ahead and participate. Let us know what comes up for you, and we want to keep this interactive. If you do at any point during the event um, feel inclined to donate, we are 100% volunteer-based organization, so your donations mean a lot to us and help to um, help us to create events like this and keep them going for all of you. So if you did want to donate, you can head over to our Eventbrite page and you can donate via a ticket for tonight's event or for any other future events of ours. So we are the Planetary Health Collective. And if you're new to us, we are a movement of passionate food and nutrition professionals who aim to mitigate climate change and nourish human health by leveraging our roles in proximity to the food system and to patients and consumers in the process. Our ultimate mission is to connect with community members like you and activate, incubate, and elevate our leadership potential in the fight for a more climate resilient future. And our vision is to provide opportunities for more training, um, and engagement so that we can each identify what our unique skills are that we can bring into the fight for more sustainability in the food system. Um, so we educate, incubate, and activate potential leaders in the field. Um, one of our biggest goals is to provide education opportunities on how we can connect the dots between seemingly disconnected parts of food, nutrition, climate, and health. And that means connecting the dots between food, climate, labor, racial, and health justice. Um, we also welcome members of all experience levels. So if you are passionate about sustainability, and but you don't have a background in it, for example, if you're new to this kind of work, we welcome you with open arms and we're so happy that you're here. And just know that we are a space where we hope to foster your skills, your passions and get creative about how we can bring you into this work because you are important and we need you. Um, and lastly, we take action alongside of our allies so that we can work intersectionally um, towards more systemic change in food and climate at all levels. So that's who we are hosting tonight's event. Um, meet our panelists. Tonight, we're gonna to be joined by Sarah al Nakib, Patrice Savory, and Despina Veraclas may be joining us. Um, she is in Greece right now and there's a big time difference. So we're gonna see if, if she's gonna make it. If not, that's okay. And um, I'm gonna pass it over to Breta who is going to introduce them all to you. 
Awesome. And it looks like uh, Despina did join. So we've got everyone here today. So happy to have you guys. Um, perfect. Well, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our first speaker. Um, first, we have Dr. Sarah El Makib. Dr. Sarah El Makib is an educator and assistant professor of the Department of Family and Community Health Sciences at Rutgers Cooperative Extension and a research associate for the Nutrition, or sorry, the New Jersey Healthy Kids Initiative. Um, her research focuses on the use of policy, systems, and environmental approaches to promote child health, equity, and environmental stewardship, primarily in school and community settings. So with that, Sarah, please take it away and, and share your story with us. Yeah, thank you so much um, for inviting me and thank you uh, for all those who are um, spending time with us today. So uh, like I was mentioned, my name is Sarah El Nikib. And um, and I work for Rutgers Cooperative Extension. So uh, some folks uh, don't know what that is, and so I'm going to explain it a little bit. Um, Rutgers Cooperative Extension is the outreach arm of Rutgers University, which is a land grant state um, university in, in in the state of New Jersey. And so there's actually a cooperative extension in every county um, all across the country, and it's a great place to to work in this area uh, because there's a lot of uh, transformation happening in cooperative extension uh, now. So I actually started uh, my career, you know, as an undergrad. Um, I was actually in the pharmacy school, and I switched over to nutrition because I decided I couldn't live in a lab uh, for the rest of my life, and I like to talk to people. And so I um, went into uh, nutrition to really support and help people, you know, make sustainable changes to their diet so that they can you know, live longer and happier lives. Um, and I was in a program that was very clinical. And so after my uh, dietetic internship, I went into um, a clinical, you know, small community hospital in Newark, New Jersey. Um, and it was a, a very small community hospital. So we usually saw like the sickest of the sick, right? Folks who were kind of unable to attend um, the bigger hospital down the street, um, a lot of homeless folks, a lot of uh, folks who um, kind of um, had had um, little health care access. And so um, and so the folks, you know, so because of that experience, um, you know, I was a new dietitian, I was, you know, bent on changing the world, right, improving people's lives. Um, and it it just felt really kind of hopeless when I was um, a, a clinical dietitian in this small community hospital, um, because no matter what I did and no matter, you know, my best efforts, my, the patient's best efforts, um, there was something that just wasn't working, right? And so we'd come up with SMART goals. We'd kind of work together to decide how we're going to make changes to the person's diet. And time and time again, they'd come in and um, you know, and and have more complications, and oftentimes it it was chronic diseases like diabetes, right? Where um, people would come in with like high blood sugars that would lead to you know infection, that would lead to a toe amputation and then a foot amputation, and so it became really disheartening um, as a young dietitian working in that area, and so uh, I did a lot of soul searching, and at the time, uh, Robert Johnson Foundation had been publishing a lot on the social determinants of health and, and looking at health from a holistic perspective. And so I decided to go back and, and pursue my master's in public health. And my master's in public health really gave me an understanding of root causes and, and the opportunity to think about, okay, what about you know um, this interaction with this, this person is not working, right? It's not their intention. It's not their interest in change. It's actually the system or the environment in which they live. And so that really pushed me towards working on like this policy systems and environmental level to really support um, healthy behavior change. Um, and, and so I, you know, one thing led to another, I ended up in cooperative extension, even though I didn't know much about it um, before um, coming, you know, finding myself uh, in cooperative extension for my career. And there, there was a, in cooperative extension, there's like three main departments. So there's agriculture and natural resources. And those are the folks that help farmers and community gardeners and master gardeners um, with horticulture and agricultural issues. And then there's 4-H youth development. 
And then there's additionally our department, which is family consumer sciences or family and community health sciences at Rutgers. And so um, there was a lot of interest in kind of um, looking at how we can help people like live healthier lives, uh, but everyone was working kind of in their own silos, right? So the ag folks were just working with farmers, the, the you know, 4-H folks were just working with youth and, and young, young people, and our department kind of worked across the spectrum, but mainly for, you know, people with chronic diseases. Um, and so I, you know, one thing, um, you know, being in the office with people from different, you know, who, who have different perspectives and serve different audiences, um, I found myself really interested in agriculture and kind of, I uh, learned about, you know, the food waste issue, uh, both, you know, in the farm, but also, you know, realizing that there was a lot of food waste um, happening at the consumer level. Um, and Would you so, be able to get that, sweetie? Okay. Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, having uh, learned a lot about food waste, um, you know, there was a, an interest in connecting the dots, right? So I work in communities that can barely find food um, and, you know, in some places that would be considered almost like food swamps, right? Where there's a lot of fast food um, and a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of options uh, that are not very healthy. Um, and at the same time, you know, you have places, you know, a few miles away, uh, 10, 20 miles away that are just plowing over their produce because, you know, uh, they don't have enough labor to, to pick it or whatever the reasons were. And so really trying to connect the dots and looking at things holistically um, um, really kind of changed the trajectory of my career. And so I, I never thought I'd be a, you know, a dietitian or a registered dietitian working on food waste issues, um, but somehow um, because of, uh, uh, you know, this holistic view of, of um, health and nutrition, and nutrition being part of, you know, um, the food system, you know, um, and looking at the food system as a whole, I found myself looking at like food security programs and food uh, waste programs and access food programs um, and to try to figure out how to connect the dots and really support uh, people who um, needed to get access to the food and wanted to get access to healthy food, but just didn't have the ability of, you know, it's not affordable. Um, or any of those things to, to really connect them to the um, to the places where there was excess food. Um, and so uh, that's been a lot of the work that um, I'm currently doing um, in schools and in the community. I'm also part of a group called the New Jersey Food Democracy Collaborative, uh, which is a collaborative uh, that was, you know, grassroots uh, developed by a colleague from Stockton University that really supported looking at you know the food system as a whole and really breaking these silos and bringing people together and so bringing folks who are like from the urban you know ag community you know you know um, black and brown farmers or urban farmers who are you know working in Newark um, creating community farms or Patterson creating community farms with um, big you know bigger more uh, traditional farmers that had uh, family farms for generations you know, with your consumers and uh, not just any consumers, but like corporate consumers, right? Like um, hospital systems and and um, and school systems like Rutgers and things like that. Um, and and people who are on SnapEd and and uh, SNAP and and WIC and look, learning about their experiences. And so the Food Democracy Collaborative is like an opportunity for all of those folks to get together um, to kind of be at the same table and really look at. Uh, what are the, you know, what are the issues? What are the assumptions we're making? Um, we actually had the Secretary of Ag in New Jersey, uh, Secretary Fisher, attend, you know, a meeting and he mentioned to me um, in a follow-up meeting that it was, you know, it was the first time he heard some of these um, experiences of folks, right? Um, and so really collaboration across um, disciplines and, and across silos and, and allowing people to who have lived experience to come in and, and speak as experts of their lives um, was really something that I think, um, you know, changed changed a lot of the way I, um, we work and, and a lot of the things we did. And so um, with the New Jersey Food Democracy Collaborative, we're now looking at um, a system where we're developing, you know, food policy councils across the state of New Jersey um, to see if we can develop local action plans that can impact uh, state-wide uh, efforts. 
And so it's uh, it's something that we're really excited about the opportunity and, and there's definitely going to be a need for uh, more, you know, um, you know, folks who are interested in food systems, not, you know, it could be nutrition folks, but it could be other um, folks who are interested in food systems, um, you know, re resilience and transformation. So um, I'll hand it back to uh, Breda if, um, uh, and we'll answer questions, I think, later, correct? Yes, we'll do questions at the end. So thank you so much, Sarah. That's fantastic. Your job seems so interesting. And I think we have a lot to learn and a lot of questions. Um, perfect. And next up, we have Patrice Savory. And Patrice is most inspired by the intersection of food, sustainability, wellness, and culture. She holds a master's degree in food studies, along with a degree in culinary arts. Patrice has taught at various institutions on sustainable food systems and mindfulness, and she is looking forward to continuing to explore the connection between mindfulness and sustainability and sharing that with others. So I will hand it over to Patrice to tell us her story. Hi, thank you so much and happy summer solstice, everyone. Um, so I'm gonna start off with saying that I am a person who gravitates towards change. I seek it out. And so I have done many pivots over the course of my career, but for the last 20 years, I've dedicated myself to um, the food industry in, in many different capacities, which I won't go into tonight. I just really wanna talk a little bit about what I've been thinking about lately, um, what I've been doing. Um, as, as it was already mentioned that I'm really interested at this intersection of food, sustainability, wellness, and culture. And I've been teaching on all of these topics since 2011. Unlike the other panelists today, I do. I have. I don't have a nutrition degree. I'm not a registered dietitian. I have my master's in food studies, and so with that degree, I'm able to look at um, through the lens of food and examine food systems, social economics, politics, nutrition, culture, and public health. And and really, I used to tell my students, there's not one topic that I can't somehow relate to food. Um, I also have that culinary arts degree, and I was really fortunate that my culinary school focused on sustainability. Um, so um, marrying my two degrees has really made me um, uh, uh, fairly proficient as a, as a food educator. So um, for seven years, I taught at Bastyr University in Seattle. It's a school of natural medicine, and I was a professor in the nutrition department. Uh, they have a culinary nutrition program that emphasizes a holistic approach to nutrition using whole foods ingredients with a focus on sustainable um, food systems and how they are aligned with health. Um, I taught a range of cooking courses um, in the Pride's Kitchen at Bastyr University um, where we sourced um, all the ingredients for the kitchen were sourced um, from local, um, local areas, whether it's farmers or stores or purveyors or vendors, um, certainly using um, all in, uh, organic ingredients, minimally processed, um, and, and some of the produce was even um, from the garden that the university had. Um, I also taught, in addition to all these cooking, array of cooking classes, which I'm happy to talk about later, um, I taught food service management and food and culture, nutrition life cycle courses, I'm sure that many of you are familiar with already. Um, and I often would bridge the kitchen um, with these classes um, to enhance experiential learning outside the classroom. So cooking has always been really, really important to me for my entire life. I really believe that the kitchen is the heart of the home um, and that to be well, you need to cook well. Um, and it's a way that we nurture ourselves and others um, where we, um, what we choose to eat in part impacts our lives as well as uh, uh, the, the planet, the health of the planet. And so I think collectively what and how we eat is really, really, truly significant. So as well, I was teaching all these classes at Bastyr that I began to recognize the, the power of cooking. Um, mentoring my students, I saw how they were connecting with food and each other in a really deep way. Uh, it was intentional, it was educational, it was therapeutic sometimes, um, and it impacted their lives much be it far beyond that kitchen classroom. So I just wanted to share a few of the practices that I used in the kitchen, and it might be helpful for you um, and your home kitchens as well as perhaps in some of your kitchen labs. Um, some of the key things that I emphasized were treating your kitchen as a temple. It's the heart of the home, it's a sacred space for nourishment, 
treasure it, keep it clean and tidy. Um, it also, by having a tidy kitchen, can also impart clarity and focus and calmness and clean as you go. Um, we all sometimes get in the weeds in the kitchen sometimes, but try and avoid that disarray and revel in those moments when you are cleaning at the end, washing the dishes, wiping down the counters. Engage your, sis, your, your senses in the kitchen. Tap into what you see, what you smell, what you taste, what you hear, what you touch. Honor those ingredients. Consider the labor behind your food, what it took to produce that food, who cultivated it, who harvested it, who transported it. Um, treat your ingredients well and with the respect that they deserve. If you're eating um, animals, for example, and um, uh, a product, animal protein products, um, those animals sacrifice their lives to make food for us, and they deserve to be having that respect, um, even to the end when you're cooking the, 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 the meat. Um, pay careful attention um, to, to the, your plants as well. Align yourself with seasonality um, with your ingredients. This is really a strong way to keep that connection with nature. And above all else, as was already mentioned, please don't waste food. Um, we, we, I'm, I'm here in Oregon, but Washington State also composts. So we have a strong compost um, uh, program in our cities and also in our schools and in the kitchens that, that we are working in, which is really makes things very convenient for us. The fourth thing I'd like to impart um, uh, for you is to experience the vibration. Food is, you know, is energy. And ideally, we want to eat vibrant, nutrient-dense, sustainable foods um, that nourish our bodies. But cooking also involves an emotional energy. And in fact, there are many cultures that believe that your thoughts and your feelings and your intentions are infused in the foods that you're preparing. So cook with love and gratitude and kindness. Uh, there is a quote that I love that's called, that said, kitchen is, the kitchen is for dancing. And so tap into some of that joy as well in your kitchen. And all of these good vibrations will only enhance your food um, and your eating experience. Another uh, tip that I just have is savor your ingredients. We eat with our eyes first. So take in that beauty of the food that's on your plate and, and breathe in the aromas and then eat relishing the flavors and the textures in your mouth. Also slowly and savor each bite and really get um, it's a sensual experience. It's a pleasure eating can be a can be for some people a very pleasurable experience. And the last thing is to gather at the table. A shared table is definitely a desired experience. It's where we make social connections. Uh, we have, may have memories of, of traditional family gatherings. When we're, when we're communing with others, um, we're sharing good food and it's nourishment for the soul, not only for our bodies. And expressing praise or gratitude for the meal on the table is also a good practice. With these six key items that I emphasized in my classes, I realized that they were all part of a mindful practice. And that being in the kitchen was a better way to build a consciousness around food, as well as encouraging one's food literacy. So um, as I mentioned when I started that I am a person that likes change. And as much as I loved my job at Bastyr, I left <laughs> uh, to take some time off to travel and to think about what I wanted to do next with my career. Um, just before the pandemic started, I began teaching online classes at, at uh, Rio Salado College. They have a sustainable food systems program. It is a community college, but the courses um, really dive deep into food, into food systems and food sustainability, and I highly recommend it if that's something that you're interested in. Um, in addition, I have been exploring mindful cooking and ways I can further incorporate it into my work. Um, I um, am in the midst of finishing up a mindful teaching certification course, and, um, and I also designed a six-week mindful cooking practice that weaves meditation, cooking, food sustainability, and wellness. And I had the opportunity to test the course out with a group of students at Oregon State University uh, last summer, and they've invited me back, so I'm really looking forward to doing that again. And um, really, now that the pandemic has somewhat subsided, it's not over yet, but I am finally ready to um, branch out and start looking for full-time work and, and new opportunities out there. And I just want to conclude um, um, my, my talk just by saying that, you know, we are really at an incredible moment, an incredible time for a lot of change. 
um, our systems are, many of our systems, as you know, are broken and our food system is broken. And so I think this is just a per perfect time for all of you guys out there to blaze new trails in your field of nutrition and to seek new ways and new approaches of how you want to practice it. Um, we are a nation of many cultures and, and many different traditions and beliefs and health practices. And I, I just want to end by saying that um, let your work reflect some of these, some of these traditions um, and some of these differences, because um, we all are, deserve access to good food weight and to nourish our, that nourishes our health as well as nourishing our planet. Uh, and really the quote I just want to end with from the famous gastronome Briat Severin said the destiny of nations depends on nourishing themselves. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Patrice. I'm so excited for us to dive in to all your work uh, as we go on tonight. So thank you so much. Um, great. Well, now we have uh, Despina and hold on, let me get switched back over. I lost power just a second ago. So <laughs> recouping things a little bit, but uh, tonight we have Despina Varaklas and Despina is a freelancer, a health educator, clinical dietitian, and international speaker. She has a degree in nutrition and dietetics and psychology, as well as supplementary classes, pardon me, um, as well as supplement classes in religious studies from Arizona State University in the United States. Her real pathos lies in patient education and patient approach with the main focus on chronic disease. She put together her own patient approach system, what she calls work with yourself, work with your patient approach. It's aim a more patient centered care or to put simply uh, better health care. So love all of that. And Despina, please take it away and share your journey with us. Okay. Can you hear me? Am I okay? Or yeah, we can hear you. Great. And um, you're good to go and to share your slides. All right. Okay, well, first of all, thank you so much for having me here. And I, I really feel humbled being among people who, who have careers in sustainability, um, unlike me. <laughs> you know, when I first got the invitation, I was like, what? <laughs> what do I have to say? But anyway, I guess I belong to uh, the group of people who do not have a, a, their career in sustainability, uh, but are willing to do a lot toward that. So, um, and maybe I speak more on behalf of people who are probably, you know, sitting in an office or um, working in a hospital or, you know, having their own business, but um, are very keen to do a lot in the field of sustainability. Now, um, as you um, said, um, I am a clinical dietitian. I am a psychologist. Uh, I studied in the U.S. I worked in um, Europe, Asia, Africa, U.S. So my experience and, and knowledge is sort of in the um, global uh, arena. And uh, basically, I have a bus an online business. And my business is sort of an umbrella for a few things and projects that I am doing. Um, I have my online one-to-one -one consultation um, office. I, uh, uh, I am an international public speaker and, and I also do workshops for healthcare professionals, teaching them how to have more productive meetings with their patients. And I do that by using uh, the WIP approach, which is a theory I put together a few years back. And I'm very proud to say that it's, it, it has quite a bit of success. Um, since I'm in Greece, I'm showing you this slide. <laughs> this is where I should be now, but anyway. <laughs> um, the uh, the reason I am here today is to talk to you about my YouTube channel. Now, first of all, I want to say that even though my whole career is not in sustainability, 
and I'm focusing more on uh, a patient approach. Uh, I grew up in a home where both my parents were very uh, conscious about healthy eating. And healthy eating is uh, something that has a different definition in different parts of the world. Uh, but um, I declare that I'm very much in love with nature. So, and I think uh, more so my dad is the person who uh, sort of planted this in me, let's say. Now he was an educated man, but this is where he felt happy most. When he was in our orchards and he was among the orange trees and olive trees, and he was next to his bees, he loved his bees. So, um, and he passed on to me something very, very important. He taught me how to see the greatness in the simple. And I think that this is very important. Uh, and this is what nature is all about. Because, you know, we may be seeing simple things like flowers and leaves and colors you know, a, a small flower or a fruit. So what, you know, uh, these are just oranges or lemons but, and or herbs that create a beautiful uh, view. But behind that, there are these very dedicated workers, the tiny little insects that do so much, you know, or uh, small birds or you know, just plants, or even the sun and the water and the moon that simply put this whole thing together so gracefully and so majestically. And just to have this beautiful thing, nature, which is our natural environment, ready for us humans. Wow. I mean, and especially for us dietitians, to me, by definition, the profession is something that makes us, or, you know, we, we simply have to be advocates of nature. Unfortunately, I've seen <laughs> different things of that, but either way. Anyway, so now as a nutrition consult, consultant, um, nutrition consultation has changed through the years. I remember in the old days, you know, we used to talk about you know, food and food habits and uh, behavior toward food, et cetera. Then things changed and we were talking about ingredients. Um, I mean, a gazillion items in the grocery store. People don't know what to pick anymore. And what's the difference between each and the next? Uh, and there's low fat and there's high fat. And then it was the fortified, fortified with vitamins, fortified with uh, calcium and, uh, I don't know, minerals. And then it was substitutes. No, now sugar is substituted with something else. And then we came down to the superfoods. And we've sort of managed to make things so complex ourselves. Instead of seeing the, the, the nobleness of the simplicity of just what's there. And personally, I, I felt I was choking in all of this. And I was thinking, no, I need to be an advocate of nature. Okay, so, and this is where in 2017, I decided to publish my e-magazine, an e-magazine, the um, how-to of nutrition and health, which spoke in general about you know, um, health and nutrition. And basically the, the, the purpose was to support, uh, especially small producers who were uh, very keen to stick to the good, the goodness of, of the soil, the goodness in nature, and to bring producers, consumers together or producers from different parts of the world together. Um, but unfortunately sponsorship was too slow, as I say. So I, I, I put that on hold. I don't know if I'm gonna publish it again. Oh, I'm still thinking about it. And then I steered my attention to YouTube and I started putting together my YouTube channel. And last year I um, 
uploaded my first video. Now, this is my YouTube channel. It's called Straight From Nature. And uh, the purpose of this uh, video channel is to provide a video library of the different products of nature. So as you see, you know, these are the, like the last videos, the coffee and chestnut, and edible flowers, olives, dates, and every video is on a different food item. And I remember years ago, I was looking up, you know, I was trying to find some information on ginger. And I had to go through 10 articles and 15 videos and just to find out the information that I need. And I thought to myself, this whole thing needs to be in one place. And this is what these videos provide. Um, where does every product grow? How does it grow? How does it reach us? How does it look like? And does it come in different varieties? What is the nutritional value of that product? What makes it special? and very important how to include it in our lives and i'm not talking about recipes because there are a gazillion recipes on youtube but very very simple ways on how to include these items in our um, nutrition and that i think is very important especially for younger people today because we live in a fast era and we live in an era where a lot of people just don't have a good relation with the kitchen. So if I am a dietitian and I need to suggest something to somebody, um, I think an easy way to include it is, is a very good piece of information. So uh, I hope that, um, you know, it's, it's a useful project and it's a useful channel down the road. Um, it's still small. The first episode was on honey, a tribute to my late father. And then, you know, other um, items like cinnamon and onions and edible flowers. These are my photos, very proud of that. <laughs> and uh, together with the YouTube channel, there is a, a page on Pinterest with all beautiful photos of the different products. And there's also a Facebook group for discussions and comments. And under every video, you, there is the link to, to that. So I think that this is something with a lot of potential. So far, it's still small. It has a little bit over a thousand subscribers. Um, the, the views are great. The comments are lovely. And I'm very grateful to ICDA, the International um, Confederation for Dietetic Associations for uh, granting me a grant, a small grant, uh, which would be very helpful for promoting the channel. I am very glad they find it worthy of that. So um, hopefully, you know, I'm contributing positively to the whole system of, of sustainability and appreciation for nature. Amazing. Uh, this, is oh. the, this is a beautiful Santorini since I'm in Greece. I'm showing you this. And these are, you know, this is my website where you can find links to all that. It's simple. It's my name, justinavarekos.com. So that's okay. that. I don't know. Yeah. yeah, thank you. All thank right. you so much, Despina. Um, we will jump into Q&A. So I'll have all our speakers go ahead and um, turn their cameras back on. And give me one second to get you all spotlighted. Trying to. Spotlight. Perfect. And. Uh, amazing. Um, Patrice. Would you mind turning your camera back on? Thank you. <laughs> Amazing. Okay, awesome. And then, um, Despina, if you want to go ahead and do stop share, that'd be that'd be great. Ah, okay, I'm and trying. We'll... To... Uh, okay. Oh yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. There we go. Now we can all see each other's faces. All right. 
Awesome. So I do have some great questions for you guys. And for the audience, um, please feel free to send any questions in that you have, whether they're questions about everyone's presentations or if you have follow-up questions to the questions that we're going to ask now, please feel free to send those in via the chat. Um, so to get started, I'm going to start with the hardest, easy question, um, but I would just love a quick day in your life. Um, and we'll go ahead and start with Despina, just because you have, you're already unmuted. So can you give us a quick <laughs> rundown of a day in your life? A day in my life, my God, you know, um, uh, I, from the time that I, um, I turned my office online, you know, and I can work from basically anywhere. Uh, don't think <laughs> that that doesn't mean that you have to stick to a schedule. Definitely. It's, um, I don't know, it's hectic. Uh, I think just the last year I was able to work, you know, specific hours. Before that, it, it, it was endless hours of work trying to build my online um, office. Uh, I've, I definitely have to, I work a lot on my computer. Uh, everything is basically through my computer. Uh, but I also have my everyday life errands. So um, it's basically from 9.30 until 6 in the afternoon. Those are the general hours. Uh, but um, I feel very, very free having my online business. Uh, it gives me a lot of freedom to do things that I wouldn't have been able to do otherwise. But at the mm -hmm. same time, I put a lot of, of, of hours of work in it. So yeah, that's happy, happy, hours <laughs> yeah. happy hours of work. Yeah. Work, but um, yeah, this is, um, I'm basically in front of the computer most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> I, I definitely feel that too. Um, Sarah, do you want to go ahead and share with us what a normal day in your life and cooperative extension looks like? Sure. Um, so I think something I love about this job is that you're kind of with people wherever that is. Um, and so my day can look very different throughout the week. Uh, but generally speaking, I try to be out in the field for at least two to three days a week. Um, and out in the field can mean different things. I could be in food policy council meetings, uh, you know, because of COVID things have moved online. But uh, for the most part, we're, we're meeting back in person. It could be, you know, I have a lot of late nights because uh, oftentimes we need to meet people where they are. And so, um, you know, working, um, you know, during times that people aren't working, <laughs> that's usually when, you know, sometimes I'm working. And so, um, you know, you adjust your life uh, accordingly. But um, so there's a lot of, you know, late nights where I'm on in community groups or residents. Um, advisory boards or, you know, wherever it is to talk to people and learn about their issues. Um, I love the days where I have, I can be in community gardens and walk around and kind of uh, meet, you know, you know, community advocates and help, you know, figure out uh, how to support them. And then we have a lot of grants. And so, you know, there's a grant management perspective uh, to a lot of the work we're doing where, you know, we're trying to connect the university folks to the community folks and making sure that People have an equal, um, you know, um, voice at the table, and so uh, a lot, sometimes it's, you know, just connecting those things um, and reading lots of articles and reports. So <laughs> there's no typical day is basically the answer. It's varies, right? Uh, but it's a lot of work outside of the, you know, office and a lot of work inside of the office. And because it's, you know, a, you know, passion project or passion work, you feel like you're not really working. You're just kind of meeting people and enjoying your time with them, which is a, a huge blessing, I think, in, in the work we do. Yeah, that's amazing. That's exciting that, you know, people have that flexibility. I've been seeing some people who are looking for, you know, some jobs in nutrition and sustainability where it's not just, you know, that desk job and sitting there all day. So fantastic. Thanks for sharing. Uh, Patrice, how about you? What, what Give us a little rundown of a day. Yeah, in your life. well, my, my life is a, is a little different for everyone in that I'm not working part time, uh, full time, but my, my work at Rio, um, Rio Salado College in part of the Maricopa Community College system in, in, in the Phoenix, Arizona area. I'm in Portland, 
but um, I, I teach four courses um, uh, and for their, in their sustainable food system program. And the courses are ongoing. You can sign up every Monday. So I, I may have 20 students. I have four classes. So, you know, I can have, uh, the, it'll vary. And so everyone's in a different week at a time in the course. And I'm just the facilitator and the guide as they're going through the curriculum and imparting, you know, what information I can help them as they, as they go through it. So just keeping up with that and, 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 and um, mentoring students and, and supporting them on, on their journeys through these classes. Um, and, and then, um, as I'd mentioned, I, I've been working a lot with um, my meditation um, teaching certification and uh, thinking about curriculum and and courses and so I already did that one course last summer and I'm about to do it this summer so just gathering um, what what I want to focus on for this summer right now so it's already just some creative work working on recipes and thinking about the season and it'll, it will be in August and so what's available in Oregon at that time um, and um, yeah thinking about what um, uh, from a focus from a mindful focus and and where you know what we want what we want to do this this year yeah Amazing. Thank you so much. Yeah, you guys are all doing such different and such interesting work. So I think we have a great uh, variety here for everyone. And you guys all have varying degrees of education. And I that that's a really common question that we get a lot is, do, do I need to seek out advanced degrees? Do I need to seek out additional education in you know, food systems or nutrition and sustainability. And, you know, people are wondering about that because there is a cost associated with that. So I'm just wondering what yours' perspectives are with your varying degrees that we have across the board here on if you felt like that was a value for you, if you feel like it's necessary for people seeking out to do this work, that they have an advanced um, degree or specific education in this area. Um, and I'll just kind of run back up the line. And Patrice, if you have any thoughts on that, I'd love to hear them. Yeah, so you know my, my track is a little bit different, and, and in some ways it's been a little challenging too because a lot of people aren't familiar with what the heck is food study. Yeah, um, and people are more um, familiar with talking about food and from a nutrition standpoint, um, um, certainly maybe from a production standpoint as well, and then a culinary arts one. Um, I. I sustainability is a new field now. I mean, there are degrees for it, but a lot of people who are in it are learning by from the trenches. So I, I recommend right now looking for ways to learn about for sustainability and incorporating it into the degree that you already have. Um, you're right, food education, I mean, uh, additional education is so expensive, but I know for the nutrition field, you do need a master's degree. Um, working in a clinical, you know, from a clinical standpoint, but um, uh, I think if you're into sustainability, these kind of groups and meetings and and options for for um, education in that regard is 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 a little more accessible. Definitely. Thanks for your perspective on that, Sarah. What are your thoughts? Yeah. So um, for cooperative extension, uh, you don't need a PhD, even though it's a university position. Um, and not all corporate extensions have faculty, but in our case at Rutgers, we are faculty and you don't need a PhD. You do need a master's to be a faculty member, but we have folks working um, from like staff with bachelor's degrees all the way up to PhDs. And I think everyone brings their perspective, right? Um, and I think it's really, really important to kind of recognize that, you know, um, you don't have to be an expert in this field. Like kind of Patrice was saying, this is kind of a new, area. And so there's not a lot of, um, you know, um, kind of work, you know, in this area that, that, um, that you can tap into. And so I think really forging your own path. So even though my background is in, in nutrition, my master's and my PhD were in public health and not in environmental health. It was really like health education and behavior change. Um, but I found myself in, you know, doing the sustainability work uh, through partnering with folks like uh, in agriculture and natural resources. And so really like kind of being willing to go a little bit outside of your field and, and uh, you know, admitting you're a novice, right? I always tell folks, I'm like, I am not an environmental expert by any means, right? I'm not a food waste expert by any means. I just kind of stumbled into this field um, and I absolutely love it. And so I think there's, um, there's, you know, there's kind of these uh, opportunities for informal education, not necessarily like a degree, but like, you know, um, kind of 
um, you know, entrepreneurship or like working with folks that that have that experience and learning from them. Um, but yeah, so I, I mean, it's it can vary and sure having a degree can help, but also that hands on experience and field work is really, really important. Great. Thank you so much. That's that's incredibly helpful for our audience. And uh, Despina, what, what are your thoughts on additional education and what we can do? Um, well, um, you know, listening to this, I, I always am very inspired by people who do things that they have a passion for. This is extremely important because when you know what your passion is and where your passion lies and you go for that there's always automatically the aspect of ethics going with it and when you start something that you haven't done before you know that first of all you need to know what you're talking about you're not just you know selling whatever uh, and you know how to go around and get the knowledge and the information. So every time I, I, I begin a project, like when I started the YouTube channel or the magazine, or when I you know, started putting together my theory on patient education, it's things that I've, I haven't done before. And every time I'm like, okay, I knew nothing about this. Where do I start? And my passion for it just gave me the drive to go and find the information. I didn't think for a second that I need an extra degree in order to do it. I just knew that I had to do it right. I had to get the right information, whatever it took for me to, to get the knowledge and do it, I had to do it. So, you know, every time I'm thinking, oh, I know nothing of this, I know nothing of that. And I'm thinking at the end, do I know anything? <laughs> But anyway, um, as we grow older, the aspect of experience and knowledge come together, and that brings a really nice result in what we do. So if you need a, an extra degree on something, you know, especially in the U.S., there is such easy access to good education. You can just register in a college and, or go easily and get a course and do something. So that makes it a lot easier to actually do what you want to do. Mm -hmm. um, and otherwise, you know, there's, you can get guidance from people who have done things before you. And today with the internet, there's so many like free classes on things. So it's mm -hmm. just a matter of time and will and how much you really want to do what you want to do. Don't go into things just because they are trendy or because somebody said there's money in it or whatever. Go with what your heart is telling you to go. This, this would be my advice. Yeah, I love that. Follow your passion and, and really start there. I think that's something a lot of people could leverage. Thank you so much. Um, Sarah, a, a question that I have is, well, you mentioned connecting some of the dots. When you like kind of zoom out and you take that systems approach to things and you're looking at that and you're connecting these dots and you're like, well, all of these things are missing that's helping people eat, healthy, uh, eat healthier or promoting a sustainable um, intersectional food system. What's your next step for going to actually to, to absolve those barriers? Yeah, I think um, it's partnerships, right? Like, I think that's the thing. Like, we, you know, food insecurity specifically is a multifaceted issue. It has to do with living wage, housing prices, rent prices, right? Like, there's so, it's like such a big issue that looking at it from a nutrition perspective alone will not do anything, won't fix the problem, right? And so really um, kind of bringing to light the fact, you know, the impacts that the food security can have, food insecurity can have on a family, right? Uh, kind of elevating the voices of the folks that need it um, and bringing it to the table where it needs to be heard. I think that's where we can really play a role. It's just almost like a facilitation role, right? Like we're not we don't need to solve the problem. We just need to make sure that the problem is highlighted and we need to make sure that the resources are being allocated to the right places. Um, and that's where I see like the, the strength of a food policy council is, is because it's multi-sector, right? You usually have 
you know, in, in really good food policy councils, you have people from the city, you know, people from economic development and the city planning authority and, you know, people that you don't think of that have to do with food, but they all have to do with food because we all have to do, you know, all of these sectors have to do with food. And so the idea is like getting them all at the table and agreeing to kind of a roadmap or a blueprint or whatever, right, priorities, a food action plan, um, and, and working your way uh, towards like some measurable change. I think that's really, um, you know, the, the way to do it because unfortunately, I know like this is this was me, right? Coming out of college, I was like, I wanna change the world. I wanna fix everything, right? But nutrition alone can't fix it. It has to be a, a real collaborative approach. And this type of change takes a long time. So you have to be patient and, and really like work um, consistently, even if you don't see the impacts right away, you know? And, th and that's sometimes disheartening for folks, but it really is really important because that's the only way um, real, real, real substance change can happen, right? Um, mm -hmm. We're undoing systems that have been there for over 300 years, right? So like, we really have to be you know, give us give some give each other some slack. And I'm saying this even though I, I barely do that, right? But I think it's something that I have to constantly remind myself. Yeah. Yeah. No, I that's super that's so helpful. I mean, people it kind of that networking aspect, going out and finding the groups that are doing the work. Um, and and whether or not you're directly volunteering or like working with them, but you know, a lot of times people don't know where people are already doing the work. And so if you can be that bridge to connect people, that's incredibly helpful. Um, and I'm constantly trying to get people to join their local food <laughs> policy councils. I don't know if I've been successful yet, but I keep throwing it out there. So yeah. um, Johns Hopkins has a really good uh, directory of all the food policy councils. And they're, especially amazing. post COVID, there are a lot of like emergency food coalitions and trying to get those folks to think about okay, that's not the root cause of hunger, right? Let's work at the root cause of hunger and push them towards food policy councils, I think could be really powerful um, if we all do it together and, you know, at the same time. So hopefully, yeah, yeah. join your food policy council for sure. Yeah, all right, well, thank you so much. Um, I know we're coming up on our time here. Um, I do have one more question for Patrice and Despina. So um, if you guys can hang around for one more minute or so, I, I, I would love to get these answered if you don't mind. No problem. Okay, perfect. Um, Patrice, we had a question asking if you can share how you use culinary classes to connect the dots between food, climate, agriculture, health, and energy. Um, yeah. it, it resonates with a lot with what we do here. And I think our audience has been really inspired by that. So my classes are a little different in that it's not, you know, a lot of cooking classes are entertaining and I'm, I'm really, I'm not that person. I mean, I, I can be entertaining for sure, but um, uh, and a lot of the classes that I've taught, let's say at last year, for, for example, it would be an hour lecture. So it was if it was, for example, the week that we're focusing on, you know, there's certain, the, the, there are certain topics every week. So if it was the meat week, for example, I would go deep dive into all aspects and issues about meat and about the nutrition components and how it's raised and how it can be sustainable and its impact on climate change. And, and then we would go in the kitchen and make prepare a meal that, that we would also incorporate, learn how to cook um, a beautiful grass fed piece of beef, but it would be you know, small, talking about small portions, there would, you know, a 16 ounce steak would feed, you know, four to four to five people or so. And, and, and just, there would be more vegetables on the plate for per se. Um, and so if I'm just doing a culinary class, I always allow time for some of the conversations to talk about, to make those connections, to talk about where that food came from, how it was produced, how it's aligned with what we're doing today and putting it on the plate. And always at the end of my cooking classes, there's time to sit down together as a group and, and to eat and enjoy the meal. Amazing. I love that. Um, that I just to kind of riff off of that, that uh, aligns a lot with one of our events that we have coming up called Cook for the Climate, which, you know, we'd love for everyone to join if you can. Um, but yeah, that that is amazing. And I think, you know, we're looking at people who are doing that already and, and helping share that with the broader PHC community. So um, very exciting, the work that you're doing and what you're putting out there. Thank you. All right. And Despina, you have a lot of, you know, you've done a lot of these really big projects. And so um, oftentimes, like, we'll have people come in and say, you know, I really want 
like, this is what my passion is, but I, I don't know how I can turn that into a career or I don't know how I can, you know, make this my life because what I'm doing doesn't fulfill me. And I want to work in something that I'm passionate in. in. And, and do you have any advice for people who might be feeling like that and certain um, on maybe how they can be courageous or creative in taking those steps? Yeah, I, I think the, the, the basic thing that you think about when you're thinking of something is, uh, what am I doing it for? I mean, I want to start a project. Why? Uh, and usually the, the, the answer is that you want to make a difference. You want to make a difference in other people's lives or you want to fix something. And I think this would be a good um, drive, a good and a good direction to go. Uh, you know, when I when I started any project, it's like I'm, I I want to make a difference in other people's lives. This is, I mean, this may sound like really huge, <laughs> but uh, usually, you know. Um, each and every one of us would put like a small piece of the puzzle, a small piece of the whole picture. So the whole picture is to make a difference in the world, to make a difference in other people's lives. But my project is like one little piece in this whole picture. Um, never be afraid to talk big about what you're doing. You know, it may sound simple. I mean, I'm listening to Patrice and I'm listening to Sarah. And, uh, you know, there is a lot of love in, in what they're doing, definitely. And uh, this, this is like, this is what gives us the comfort that we're, we're on the right track. This is what, uh, you know, don't be afraid to just start doing it. Uh, just do it and then... Uh, don't think of all the steps because you start a project and then other paths start to appear in your way and things grow in a way that you never really expected. And when you do things with love and passion, you are inspirational. You inspire other people without even realizing it. And this draws people to you. Everybody wants to help. Oh, you can do this. You can do that. And, uh, you know, things start to grow without you even noticing. So just, um, you know, go for it and do your best and never be scared. <laughs> Don't be scared. Stop. I love that. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you to Fired all of by you. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry about the other two speakers. And um, I'm listening to Patrice as well. And I'm thinking, okay, now I'm in Greece and I'm in the land of good food. So, uh, you know, whenever you need anything, just please give me a buzz. And I don't know what it is cookbooks or recipes or uh, whatever, you know, because um, the, this is a country where a lot of the people are. Uh, as I said at the beginning, good food is something uh, that has a different definition in different parts of the world. Mm -hmm. So um, in this country now, since I'm in Athens at this moment, many, many people um, know how to plant. They know how to have a garden. They've, uh, th there's still a lot of generations that have eaten untouched uh, crops and foods, they know the difference. So um, it's very interesting. Everybody sort of knows what is good food. And, um, you know, in, in contrast with other parts of the world where there are, you know, cases where people have never seen an apple tree or an orange tree. So um, it's very interesting. And yes, I definitely do agree that we need to know how to cook in order to appreciate food. Yeah. Wow. Amazing. Thank well, thank you all so much for sharing your expertise and your wisdom with us. Um, I'm incredibly inspired after tonight. And I think there's just so many different avenues for you know people 
to explore within this like intersection between health, nutrition, and sustainability. So with that, we're going to go ahead and close out. Um, I know I-10 probably has some words to leave you all with. So I will just, um, yeah, let her take it away and close us out for tonight. Have a great night, everyone. Oh, we will be super <laughs> brief. Okay, everybody, can you see my screen? The Planetary Health Collective slide? Unmute and yep. just get muted. Yep. Okay, awesome. So as we're closing out here, I just want to thank you all so much for joining us tonight. This event was so personally inspiring for me. I love to hear the many different ways that we can work in this space to connect the dots between food, health, and climate. Um, this is exactly, conversations like this are exactly why the PHC exists, because we all have the same mission, the same ethos, the same goals, and we're going about them in such different and inspiring and creative ways. So I want to thank our panelists for joining us here tonight, for our participants for joining us and sharing your energy and sharing your questions. If you would like to get more involved with the Planetary Health Collective, please join us um, at www.planetaryhealthcollective.org. Get on our email list and we also have a form on our page where you can reach out to let us know you'd be interested in volunteering on one of our, re our leadership teams. We're always looking for more volunteers and if you've not yet done so please also join our Facebook group. We're constantly sharing really fantastic resources there um, and that you can find us at Planetary Health Collective on Facebook if you just do a quick search and follow us on Instagram. We're at Planetary Health Collective on Instagram and we look forward to connecting with all of you on a deeper level and at a uh, an event. Um, as Bretta briefly mentioned, we also have a brand new event. Our first one for the Cook for the Climate series is coming up this Friday. We're going to be learning how to make Navajo blue corn mush with Danae Bex. She's an incredible public health registered dietitian from the Navajo Reservation in Arizona. She's going to be telling us all about Navajo traditions around growing blue corn, spiritual significance of it, how to eat it, and some ways that we as food and nutrition professionals can be more inclusive in our approach and aware and sensitive to indigenous representation in our care and in our nutrition education. So join us. It's a donation-based event and 100% of the proceeds will be going towards a community-based Navajo event um, with Danae and one of her colleagues at BD Baby Foods. So please join us this Friday for that. And I want to thank you all again so much for being here and we hope to see you next time. Thanks all. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah. Hold up. Okay, we're good. Okay, we're good. Okay, do you want to end the recording? Yes. Okay. <laughs>